Hello, and welcome to our supplement to lecture number six. In lecture number six, we were examining acid-base equilibria as it relates to amino acids. Um, I often find that acid-base equilibria is one of the tougher subjects for my students to recall uh, from two years ago when you took your freshman organic chemistry or your freshman uh, introductory chemistry um, or last year, depending on your schedule through UPEI. So I want to review the basics of acid-base chemistry um, in this lecture. And so today we are going to talk about acids and bases in water, just your basic acid-base chemistry equilibria. And so these are the handouts if you want to uh, download those to the Moodle site and follow along on paper. So acids have been known obviously for a very long time. Here we see a uh, uh, famous Roman philosopher talking about the nature of acid. And uh, I imagine they understood acids to be things that dissolve metals. Um, but of course, now we know that acids are things that, uh, at least in water, ionize into water and their counter ion, or their hydronium ion and their counter ion. Arrhenius was the first person to propose a theory behind acids, and he proposed that you had this ionization or this dissociation, just like salt, to sodium positive and chloride negative, you would go to proton positive and chloride negative. It seemed obvious. But this wasn't correct, even though it did explain a lot of observations at the time. Uh, it took uh, a few years later, uh, basically 20 years later, for Brunsted and Lowry to propose that, no, that proton doesn't just dissociate away. That proton must be accepted by something. And acid always gives its proton to a base. And what was that base? In this case, that base was water. Water receives the proton and becomes the hydronium ion. So they're the ones who sort of uh, brought into the idea of the, well, the bronsted lowry acid-base theory that we use today, which is acids donate to bases. And there's always a pair, an acid and a base. And over here, there's the acid and there's the base. In theory, you could go backwards, although not in water. Now, we must go back in time and remember our acid-base uh, equilibria. So we know that we have an acid and a base and we'll have the transfer proton transfer products over here, the conjugate acid. The conjugate acid is just the base that is now in its acid form. The conjugate base is now the acid that it is in its basic form. So if you ever hear the word conjugate base, you know it's an acid in its basic form. It's the opposite of the way it started. That's all it means. And there's an equilibrium constant for this, and there it is. So you basically products over reactants. But water, of course, is it's everywhere. It's the solvent. Its concentration never changes. So rather than using equilibrium constant, we often use acid equilibrium constant where we fold the concentration of water into the equilibrium constant and simplify our equation. We only have the things that can change here. The amount of acid you put in and of course what it's associated to. Um, and the fact is that the acid association equilibrium constant is equal to the equilibrium constant times the concentration of water. That's constant, that's constant, so the whole thing is a new constant called Ka. So Ka is really the only value we have to worry about. It's going to tell us the relative strength of an acid. Ka values, whatever their numbers, are just going to tell us how strong an acid is. So there's a guy, how strong is he? Well, we need to compare him with other people and see how strong they are, and then we'll know where he fits in the uh, strength. Is he in the middle of the gym, top of the gym? We'll find out. So here's an acid, and there's its Ka value. Now let's compare the Ka values for a number of familiar acids. That's a pretty big Ka value, 100. That's a strong acid. It fully dissociates in water. I think that's the value in DMSO. It's, it's Ka value in water would be a lot higher than that. Um, so this is a strong acid. You put this in water, and it always dissociates completely to chloride and hydronium ion. Um, we always display the hydronium ion as H+, plus because we have forgot about the water, so we kind of forget about the water part over here. But remember, this is donating to water. This is not the Arrhenius scheme, even though it's written that way. This is Bronsted-Lowry. Um, and acetic acid donates its proton to water but very weakly, 10 to the minus five, that's like 0.00001-ish, right? That is a very small number. So that's a weak acid. It will donate its proton, but it doesn't do it to a great extent. The same with the acidic form of imidazole and this uh, thiol here, which is something that you'd see in cysteine. They are weak acids. And, uh, and basically they won't fully dissociate in water. 
Of course, you can get to things that we often consider to be bases. We think of an amine as a base, and it would accept a proton from water. We think of an alkoxide as a base, and it would accept a proton from water. But in chemistry, at least at the more advanced levels, we tend to always think of things from the acid side. So this base, I'm not thinking of the Kb of that base. I'm thinking of the Ka of its acidic form, which is incredibly small. And of course, the smaller it is, the less likely it is to give up the proton, which means, of course, the stronger the base. If you are less likely to give up the proton, you're a stronger base. If you are less likely to give up a dollar bill, you are a greedy person. So if you have a very small Ka, then in fact, your basic form must be the stronger base. Just keep that in mind. Now, one of the problems with acid-base equilibria is expressing the wide range of the values of the scale. So just like these two animals are really, they're really not in the same league. They're really not in the same scale. You have to be careful about how you use numbers in acid-base equilibria. Here is the Ka from zero to 100. Now we know that HCl, uh, the pKa value we had this, that to start off with was 100. And this was 0 0.00001. And that was smaller than that and smaller and smaller and smaller still. So let's put all of these on this graph. So here I am putting these values. There's the 100. So we took 100, we put it here. Now I'm gonna put 0 0.00001 on the graph. There it is. Now I'm gonna put 0 0.00001 on the graph. There it is. Now I'm gonna put 0 0.00001 on the graph. There we go. Now I'm gonna put nine zeros before the one on the graph. And now I'm gonna put 15 zeros before one on the graph. And there we go. How does that look? That's a nice graph. It basically looks like two points, right? So I haven't been able to differentiate graphically these values from each other. So if I was trying to plot this, I'd basically have a vertical wall of points depending on whatever value the y-axis was, and then this one point out over here, wherever it is in the y-axis. That's not a very useful graph. All right, well, let's just delete that point and only graph these. Let's just take care of the one that's too far out. We'll only graph these. That seems like a solution. So let's take those, those ones right there, and we're just gonna spread them out. So so you can see what I've done here is I'm redoing it. I'm now taking it just from uh, those very low values that these four represent. I'm, I'm taking off the high one. That should solve my problem, right? So 10 to the two, let's put it on the graph. Woo, there it is, somewhere out there next door. Okay, now these remaining five should be on the graph. There's 0.00001-ish, right? So that's exactly where that is. That's 10 to the minus five-ish. And now let's put on like basically five zeros before the one, and then we'll put on, here we go, seven zeros before the one, and then we'll put on nine zeros before the one, and then we'll put on 15 zeros before the one, and you see what happens. These small values are still absolutely on top of each other. And you know what? Look, there's a, a million-fold difference between the scale of these two numbers. There is no value that I can put on that would allow us to look at all of these numbers on the same graph. They're either going to be in the next continent or they're all gonna be on top of each other with a few in the middle. That's the problem with this enormous range of scale. How can we solve it? Well, if you look at the solar system, solar system, you know, a lot of people think that planets are evenly spaced, but they're not. The four inner planets are all on top of each other. And then there's the rest. The gas planets are like way out there. But if I wanna sort of express the scale in a way where I can uh, talk about um, the inner planets and perhaps a little more, uh, 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 smooth way, what you might want to do is use what we call a log scale. So what will log do? A logarithm is turning all numbers into the powers of 10. So instead of talking about 100 and 200 and 300, you just talk about 10 to the power of what? And that puts everything basically on a scale of orders of magnitude. And here is the key to all of science, the, the true key to the universe, the log key. If you can do logarithms, you can do pH and you can understand the wide range of acid-base values and proton concentrations that we'll have uh, in solution. So, you know, 10 to the power of two, the log of 10 to the power of two is two. The log of 10 to the 1.7, which is 50, is 1.7. The log of one, which is 10 to the zero, is zero. The log of 0.1, which is 10 to the minus one, is minus one. The log of this number, which is actually 10 to the minus 16, is minus 16. That's all a log is, is what power of 10 gave you that number? That's all log asks. So you can see how I can turn all of these into logarithms. So let's see what that does with our scale. Instead of going from zero to 100, I'm going, so 100 would be 10 to the two, which is about here. I can now just ask us what, what power of 10 is it? That's 10 to the two, right? Let's put 10 to the two on the graph. 
This is like around 10 to the minus five, where was that gonna end up? 10 to the minus 4.7, right? This was in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus six, wasn't it? There it is. This was in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus eight. There it is, et cetera, et cetera. So now you see, I have expressed all of these Ka's as 10 to the power of something. But rather than um, say, this is 10 to the minus 16, this is 10 to the minus 12, you can just log that scale. And here I've just logged it. So there's the log of the Ka minus 16 all the way to zero. Now remember, pKa is the negative log. So that would be 16 to zero in pKa. So with the logs, you can plot the entire universe. There's 10 to the minus 24 meters. That is the size of a quark. There's 10 to the plus 24 meters. That is the edge of the known universe. You can graph everything in between. There is a cell, a bacterial cell. There's you. There's Earth's orbit, all of it on one graph. That is what logarithms can do. And that's why we use them in pH to express the enormous scale difference between a hydronium ion concentration of 10 to the minus 14, which is a very strong basic solution, to a hydronium ion concentration of 10 to the minus 1, which is a very strong acid solution. So pH is the negative log of proton concentration. And pH was invented by a biochemist. This is Soren Sorensen, and he was a physical chemist uh, looking into the biochemistry of, well, of blood. And uh, at the turn of the century, when people were really interested in the ability of blood to absorb oxygen, they found out that it was very dependent on the acid strength of the system you were doing. Uh, th there was a acid concentration changed the ability of hemoglobin to bind blood enormously. And we'll see this. Acid is going to affect protein structure, and it's going to change protein properties. So it's very important to know the acid strength. Now, of course, you know the acid strength. If you put in, you know, a little bit of HCl, that's the exact acid strength, the concentration of HCl. But what he was noticing was that acids he was adding, he wasn't getting the same hydronium ion concentration as the acid he added. If you add HCl, you're going to get 100% of that acid as hydronium concentration. But if you add acetic acid, he was able to measure hydronium ion concentration electrochemically with these electrodes that were being invented at that time. And so really, once the electrode came along and you could measure hydronium ion concentration directly, what he was discovering was it wasn't the same as the acid he had added. There were these weak acids that were not fully dissociating. So he had to come up with a way to express the protonation power of water. So pH is the puissance or the power of hydronium ion in water, and he defined it as the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. So it didn't matter how much acid you added, the question was, what was the hydronium ion concentration, which he could measure with an electrode. If you add, um, if you have pure water, and you add one drop of HCl, you will get basically the concentration converted directly to hydronium ion, that's, that's the concentration of hydronium ion. If you add that same thing to a solution of sodium acetate, you don't change the hydronium ion concentration very much at all because you're titrating really some of the sodium acetate. You have a buffer there. And this is the sort of the thing he was dealing with when he was defining what pH was. So he uh, would take basically the concentration of hydronium ion here. There it is for a uh, strong acid solution. Here it is for the buffer solutions. And you know if you wanna talk about uh, that was before and after, here's before and after again. And the problem is they all end up on top of each other. But if you do it with the minus log of H, which is the pH, then suddenly the original concentration of neutral water, that's the hydronium ion concentration of neutral water, what it turns into when you add a drop of acid is very different to what it turns into if there was a buffer there. Before, this tiny number landed on top of that tiny number on the linear scale, and you couldn't tell the difference between them. Now you can with the log scale. So pH is a log scale. It lets you see between uh, these two tiny numbers relative to that, well, sorry, these two bigger numbers relative to this tiny number. So instead of them both being on top of each other relative to 10 to the minus 7, they are now spread out along the pH scale. So if we know what the pH or the protonating power of the solution is, and we know the Ka of an acid, we should be able to determine how much of one form and the other exists at equilibrium under those conditions. The Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is not going to help you determine how much acetic acid dissociates if you add a drop of acetic acid to neutral water. What it says is you have set the pH. You know the pKa. 
what is the ionization of that acid under these known conditions, this condition and this fact. That is what, and, and this formula was, was well known well before Henderson and Hasselbach proposed this formula. This is just a rearrangement of the acid equilibrium formula, but they basically popularized this idea that you could take the log of the acid equilibrium equation and create this simplified form of it, which very quickly, the difference between the pH that you have set your conditions to and the known pKa, you could quickly determine what the ratio of the ionization was. So Henderson and Hasselbach uh, sort of popularized this form of the acid equilibrium equation. So all we do is we take the acid equilibrium, we make the statement of its equation, we log both sides, and that's it. That's the equation. Now, if I multiply everything by minus here, get the negative log of this, the negative log of that, uh, basically you turn it into this. I've flipped it over here, flip it over there. That makes things negative. And now those are the pHs and the pKa's. Negative log is pH. So P, 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 P. So that's how you get the Henderson and Hasselbach equation. Just state the equation, log both sides. If I take log H over here, it's negative. If I take log Ka over here, it's negative. And then just translate them into P's. And there is the Henderson Hasselbach equation. It is just the acid equilibrium equation. It's no different. Now, here's why that train was at the start. What are these things right here? Well, they're buffers. And if you've ever seen Thomas the Tank Engine, he's always going on about buffers. And buffers are these big sort of uh, bumpers, if you will, at the front of engines. And they're also, uh, there's big buffers on those big stops at the end of railway tracks. And they're meant to absorb the shock of an engine hitting something. This would absorb the shock of, say, the engine hitting the rail cars when you're linking it up. That's what buffers do. They absorb the energy or they provide a capacity to uh, absorb the energy. What's a buffer in sort of farmland? You have this buffer zone in farmland. There it is, a buffer zone around streams and things. This means that basically what you're doing in your crops all the what you're spraying on your crops, the fertilizer, the poisons, etc., have a space to be absorbed before they hit the sensitive stream. So these buffer zones will absorb or prevent change in the stream. They absorb bad things that are coming in before they can change the stream. You see buffer zones all over the world. This is the buffer zone in Cyprus between the Turkish Cypriot side and the, uh, I presume, original Cypriot side or the Greek Cypriot side. And this is the UN buffer zone. And it's meant to keep the two sides apart. Basically, the UN's in there, and people over here can't kill the people over here because there's a buffer zone between them. And if anyone makes a move in here, the UN's got you know a certain number of miles to stop them before they can uh, cause any trouble. So that's a buffer zone. We see these ideas of buffers all the time. And what are buffers in chemistry? Buffers are the same thing. They prevent change. They prevent a war. They prevent uh, uh, movement. And look at this. Here's, you know, steep pH change with adding acid. This is how much acid or base we add. Here's how much base we add. If I'm adding base, steep change until we start titrating the buffer. A buffer is just a titration. It's a titration caught in the act. There's the middle of the titration. Look, if I add some base to that, how much am I changing the pH by? Not very much. So while we're titrating, we can only change the pH by a little bit because we are now dealing with the buffer agent. Once that's all gone, of course, pH can change rapidly. So while we are buffering a particular ionizing, ionizing group, pH will change slowly. It's all a buffer is, is a titration caught in the act. And that means we bring Henderson and Hasselbach back. That's right, you just say, I'll be back, baby. And so here's the Henderson and Hasselbach equation, and it basically describes a buffer. If I know the pKa and I know the pH, and they're pretty close to each other, you'll see that there's lots of A and lots of HA. Imagine these are equal, the difference is zero. That means there's 50% A, 50% HA. If there's lots of A and lots of HA, that means if I add acid or I add base, the proton's gonna be going on to this A or coming off of this HA. I've got to either fully titrate it in one direction or another before the pH can change significantly. So really, as long as pKa of a uh, group is close to the pH, that group will act as a buffer because it, it is being titrated. So all a buffer is is a titration caught in the act. So here I have a mixture of 50-50 mixture of acetic acid and sodium acetate, that's the acid. And that's the basic form of the same molecule, which means, of course, these are 50-50 now, right? And that means that if this is 50 and this is 50, the log of 
50 divided by 50 is the log of 1. The log of 1 is 0. So that means that the pH is equal to the pKa. So if the pKa is 4.7, if I have a 50-50 mixture, the pH is 4.7. That means you can set the pH by knowing how much of the acidic form and how much of the basic form of a molecule you add to your solution. You can actually just take a bottle of acetic acid and a bottle of sodium acetate, mix them together in the appropriate amount, and I bet you'll be at your target pH plus or minus 0.1, just like boom, like that, because if you know the ratio, you know the pH. And there's the proof of it. If it's 50-50, the pH is going to be 4.7. Now, what if you've got that buffer and I want to make it to be pH 5. I want pH 5. I don't want pH 4.7. I want 5. Well, all you have to do is just find the ratio that would get you pH 5. And, and you just do this math. I want 5. That's the pH I want. The pK is 4.7. Well, what's the ratio have to be? Well, guess what? Once you solve this equation, the ratio is 2 to 1. Because the log of 2 is 0.3. So you want a 2 to 1 ratio of A to HA. So you want a little more A than HA. So basically, you can just do that. Just add twice as much sodium acetate as acetic acid and make sure everything totals up to 100 millimolar. So why do you want buffers? Well, here's a typical titration of just pure water. Now, of course, here we're titrating like the concentration of hydronium that's got us to pH 2, and so it's going to take a while to get rid of that. But the moment we start to approach neutral, like look at the difference in value here. This is basically, you know, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. There's a 100-fold difference between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 2, and that's what I titrated away from here to here. And, but of course, now, now, now there's almost nothing there. Like, I mean, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 8, these are all words for nothing. Right? So if there's nothing, the pH is going to change enormously as I add base. And then, of course, you're going to start uh, increasing the concentration of sodium hydroxide on the log scale, and it's going to level out again. But look, where's pH 7? Right here. There's pH 7 right here. That's where life lives. That's where we're going to do all of our biochemistry experiments. And what happens if a tiny bit of base was produced by the reaction? Boom. What happens if a tiny bit of acid was produced by the reaction? Boom. We're on like basically the cliff's face here. Any slight movement we make to the left or right is going to be an enormous change in pH. And pH is the protonating power. If I go down three units, and that's pretty easy by hardly moving at all, tiny bit of acid added could easily drop us three units. Look, didn't move anything on the x-axis, but I moved enormously on the y-axis. That's a big difference in pH. That's going to change protein conformations. That's going to change charges. It's going to really mess up our experiment. I need to know the pH. Now, this dye here, phenolphthalein, uh, was developed by Fisher um, as, as part of his uh, chemistry of organic compounds. He was trying to find dyes and, and things like that. It was a big business back at the turn of the century there in the 1880s to the 1900s. Dye chemistry was the reason that organic chemistry separated from biochemistry. Originally, organic chemistry was, um, was biochemistry. It was the sh chemistry of sugars. It was the chemistry of natural compounds. But once synthetic organic dyes started to be developed and we're making tons of money, organic chemistry, like sort of synthetic organic chemistry, went its own way. And Henry Perkin, a uh, famous uh, British scientist, uh, just became filthy rich, making the famous mauve dye. And it was such a popular dye, it, it, it was, uh, gave its name to an entire age of politics in uh, Britain called the mauve period, sort of the end of the Victorian uh, era. So there's phenolphthalein, the dye that was discovered by Fisher. And it uh, changes its chemistry. You know, if you deprotonate this, what's going to happen is you're going to push electrons into the single bond. You're going to kick this out as a leaving group. You're going to create a distributed pi system, and suddenly you've got color. So really what you're seeing is a chemical change that happens in phenolphthalein above a certain pH. And look what happens if you're titrating. You're titrating your sodium, or sorry, your HCl with sodium hydroxide, and then there's a point where things become super steep. And you know how when you're titrating in the freshman chemistry lab, you're like one drop and suddenly things go pink? That's because one drop took you from here to here. That one drop took you from here to here. And that's why a titration is pretty accurate as long as there's nothing in here that's being titrated. So if you're titrating a strong acid with a base, phenolphthalein is going to do a pretty good job of giving you the endpoint because it's going to take you from here to here in a single drop. That's, that's quite amazing. So there's sort of a uh, pH of a typical uh, solution that you might have. Um, and if you add a little bit of acid or a little bit of acid, look how much it changes the pH. You go all the way down to here. So if you started out at pH 5 and you added just one, one tenth 
of the amount of acid, boom, all the way down to here. What if I add that 10% in the basic form? Boom, all the way up to there. So you see basically adding just a little bit of acid or a little bit of base enormously changes the pH. And so obviously in biochemistry, we can't afford to have this issue. Our pH has to stay steady for our experiment. Well, here's acetic acid being titrated. And we know that, we know that it's pKa is 4.7. That'll be the midpoint here. And what we're doing is we're titrating. And when it's titrated away, then boom, we hit phenolphthalein. So phenolphthalein will still work for this because the steep part is above eight. Um, now we're gonna find that if we're at right here, oh, here, sorry, pH five, and we know that five is a little bit past 4.7, so it's a little bit toward the basic end of the titration. What happens if I add that small amount of acid to this situation, or a small amount of base? Look, look how much the pH changes, because I'm in the middle of a titration. That's all a buffer is, a titration caught in the act. I am titrating the buffer, so the pH won't change very much. It changes a little, it just doesn't change a lot. Obviously, you want to make sure you use a lot of buffer compared to the amount of acid you anticipate uh, being produced by a reaction so that the pH doesn't change very much. So that is the buffering region of sodium acetate. You can see that this area is, the slope here is shallow in this blue region. Obviously, sodium acetate is useless at pH 7 because it's done. Its titration is over. So there's no buffering capacity if the titration is finished. So if we were here, boom, we'd be way up there with a little bit of base. But where the pKa value, like within sort of one pKa unit, roughly, of the pKa of the buffer, you can have a buffering region or a region where it matters. Now, I want to buffer around pH 7. Sodium acetate is kind of useless for pH 7. So I need a buffer that's good at pH 7, that doesn't mess up biochemistry, that doesn't kill cells. That might be a small list. Basically, not just any buffer would do. I need a good buffer. And where am I going to get a good buffer? I will phone up Dr. Norman Everett Good, and I will say, hey, Dr. Good, tell me what your good buffers are. And he, uh, along with undergraduate researchers over a 30-year period, vetted dozens and dozens and dozens of likely compounds to be biological buffers. And he found lots of compounds that were compatible with cells, did not enter cells, um, uh, were, did not precipitate proteins, didn't associate strongly with proteins, and still had buffering capacity in the range of interest to biochemists. And this list became known as the good buffers. So good buffers are buffers that have their buffering region in this region here. Notice if your buffering region, if you did sodium acetate, a small amount of base is going to take you into the stratosphere. But if you're using one of Dr. Good's buffers, you'll hardly change the pH at all. So listen to Dr. Good, people. He'll get you the good stuff, the good buffers. There's a typical good buffer. Its pKa is almost 7. There it is being used. And a little bit of acid, a little bit of base, the pH has hardly changed from 7. And there's a whole list of good buffers. Here's another one pretty common. NSPK is a little lower. Still good for buffering around pH 7, but maybe you're thinking more like pH 6.5 or something when you're using this buffer. Uh, there's other buffers that you could use. Here's one, the pH uh, is good around 7.2, um, and, and there's just lots more. Here's another one, pretty typical uh, buffer, a little higher. Again, pretty good around pH 7. Maybe you're shooting for a pH 7.4 when you're using this buffer. Um, so a lot of buffers to choose from, all with their pKa's in the neighborhood of 7, um, and you'll choose the one that works best for you from his list of about 15 or 16 good buffers. So why would you care? Well, here is a typical experiment you might do. This is acid hydrolysis of this unsaturated fatty acid from a glycerol. And there's an enzyme that does this. Uh, monoacyl glycerol lipase, and it is an enzyme that is thought to be involved in, in cancer, or at least overexpressed in cancer tissue. So is this a target for a cancer drug? Well, if you want to do some enzyme chemistry with this to determine some molecules that will mess with that enzyme, that will prevent it from working, um, you're going to have to do some biochemistry, and you're going to need to know the pH. Otherwise, it might be the fact that the pH is changing that's altering your enzyme chemistry and not the fact that you added a, a potential drug. And if you wanted to uh, 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 follow this at pH 7, one thing you'll notice is the pKa of this hydroxyl group here on this carboxylic acid is 4.8. Well, guess what? 7 is higher than 4.8. So this will give up its proton to water and bring the pH down. But you don't want that. You don't want every single molecule 
of product being produced to be lowering the pH. But what you do is you use a biological buffer. So instead of that proton going to water, it'll go to titrate the buffer and the pH will hardly change at all. So we can control the effects of that acid, that's a carboxylic acid, and prevent it from dropping our pH if we use a buffer. So uh, there's a number of questions that uh, you could ask yourself. Um, I've, I have a document of uh, sort of acid-base problems. See if you can work through these buffer questions here, because really the essence of acid-base chemistry in biochemistry is all about buffers. We need to understand how buffers work. We need to understand the consequence of using a buffer and why we use buffers. I promise you, one of the first things that will happen if you ever get a job uh, in biochemistry, your first day in a the lab there uh, as a very junior person, I bet the first thing they're going to say is, make me this buffer. And the last thing they want to hear from you is, what's a buffer? All right, so we need to understand what buffers are. You need to understand that buffers are something that you make that you can control the pH with. And you'll, so they'll, someone will say, I want a pH 6 buffer, this total concentration, you need to know how to make that. So if you follow the math in those sort of problems, you'll learn how to, the math at least, of setting up a buffer solution. And consider these questions as you, uh, as you think about my lecture here. Um, uh, you know, take your textbook out and make sure you can answer these questions. It will guide your reading. And uh, our aperitif for the day is this uh, uh, aquavit. Um, and it's a Danish schnapps. And again, we see that aquavit, water of life uh, sort of word. And we've seen that from uh, uh, a French uh, aperitif. We've seen that from a North American aperitif. We've, now we see it from a Danish aperitif. So get this aquavit name, the water of life. Again, water is essential to life. And the acid-base chemistry in water is essential to understanding biochemistry. So think about what's protonated. Think about the general rule that the pH and the pKa, which group is going to be protonated? Is the water going to be protonated? It will be if the pH is higher than the pKa, or will it be the chemical group that's protonated? It will be if the pH is lower than the pKa. Keep all that in mind as you think about acid-base chemistry. And remember, buffers are just a titration caught in the act. As long as you are titrating, the pH change will be small with any small amount of acid or base. Obviously, if you add a ton of acid or base, you will overwhelm the buffer. Just like if you run the train into the end of the line at 100 miles an hour, there is no buffer that is going to save you. That will cause confusion and delay. Um, but if your train hits the end of the line gently, the buffers will absorb the, comp, uh, the contact. So if you add a small amount of acid, a buffer will prevent big change. And that's what buffers do, and that's why it's important to review your acid-base chemistry as you continue your biochemistry journey. Those are the references where I stole all my images, and I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, our supplement to lecture six, acids and bases in water.